Welcome to The Simsbury View. My name is Dominique Avery, sitting in for Althea Graney. Today, the view is all about bears. Judging what I've seen on social media, there have been so many bear sightings in this area this summer that they've become almost ho-hum. I wondered why. I first contacted DEEP, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, to invite one of their ex bear experts to come here, but they were so busy they didn't have time to come to Simsbury. And then I heard about a man named Paul Colburn, who is a master wildlife conservationist who volunteers his time for DEEP. In fact, he recently spoke to great acclaim at both Hubline Tower and Strattenburg State Park. Welcome, Paul. I'm so happy you crossed the river to come and join us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to your expertise. Now, why have there been so many bear sightings this summer? And are we right? Are there more? Well, uh, historically, bears were uh, what we call extirpated from the state, and they started to show up again in about 1985. Uh, there were just a handful in the extreme northwestern portion of the state. And two things uh, occurred. One, obviously, there are no hunting season or uh, way that they're being taken that way, uh, but they have excellent habitat here. They rely on forest with uh, riparian areas, and that gives them everything they need in terms of cover, food, space, and water. Riparian? Yes, riparian meaning waterways. Uh -huh. Sorry. Um, so as a, as a result of that, uh, and the fact that they have very few natural predators uh, once the cubs get to a certain age, um, the population has grown steadily from that point to today, so that we now have somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to 800 uh, in the state. That population is growing at 10 to 15% a year. Uh -huh. Which so means, that's why we see yes. more each year. Yeah. So in roughly five years, the population will double. So that, along with the development in the state, uh, obviously there's a lot of development that goes into their habitat, forested areas. And the fact that through a process called dispersal, as the young are born, they stay with the sows or the females for about 18 months, and then they're forced out and they have to find their own range. So many of the bears, especially this time of year that you see, are young bears that are uh, moving around looking for their own place to live uh, out from the shadow of uh, their mother and the dominant male that's in the range that they were born in. So um, I read somewhere that um, there were 4,000 sightings of bear reported to deep last year. And uh, Simsbury only was only fourth. It was like 218 bears I made a note of. Um, Avon had the most. I suspect that people in Simsbury see so many bears that they're not reporting them. Should they be reporting them? Yes, bears uh, definitely should. Any bear sighting should be reported to uh, DEP. Uh, and the main reason for that is the population drives the management that DEP has in place for bears. Uh, and the management is really geared toward optimum coexistence between humans and bears to, to minimize conflict. So anytime anybody sees a bear, whether it's in their backyard or driving or whatever, uh, it should be reported to DEP. There's research that's ongoing that's helping with population, but uh, we really depend uh, very strongly on uh, citizen sightings. Simsbury, actually, I looked it up before I came. I think the previous four years, there were 800 plus sightings. And then the last trailing year, another 200. So, so that been quite proves a few. my point, yes. that people have become so inured to uh, bear sightings. Uh, I mean, I, we did have one. Uh, we, uh, we've had bear sightings for years uh, in our little West Simsbury uh, place. And this year, because the weather was so bad, we left the bird feeder up a little bit longer than usual. We kept taking in at night, and one night, I hadn't gotten out there yet. It was 5.30, and a huge bear came and finished off what was there. He had a, a, a tag, so he's obviously been sighted before. And that bear seems to have come back several times. Neighbors have told me, I just haven't seen him, and we've had nothing on the deck. So, um, so I, I'm familiar <laughs> with bears, but I did report, and I urge people to do it. And they keep saying, why? It's why very important, actually. It's probably, you know, that along with taking care of uh, food, which I'm assuming we'll get into in a bit, uh, is one of the most important things people can do if they value bears. And, you know, to me, they're a really magnificent animal that we're uh, lucky to have back in the state. I used to have to travel out west and to Alaska and other places to see them. And 
We're yeah. very fortunate, I think, to have the population we have. So um, I have a lot of visitors who come from Germany and who come from Berlin. Um, I have cousins in Berlin, and their symbol is a bear. And they, they have never witnessed one. They have been dying every time they come, you know, <laughs> to see a bear. But it is sort of like being in the zoo. I mean, you, it's very exciting, isn't it? It is. Uh, I don't, you know, it's a really exhilarating experience to see one, especially in the wild. We, we had one come once. Um, we had bird food stored in the garage, and the garage door was open, and he came, and he took out one bag, and he finished it. And then uh, a day or two later, he came back again, uh, only the door was closed. And we were in the garage. We saw him. We were in the garage. He came and stood up at the door, peering for this thing that he remembered. And um, we felt like we were in the zoo. <laughs> well, it's interesting you tell that story because uh, the most important thing people can do in terms of ensuring we have minimal conflict is be careful with food. Uh, bears, other than mating season, which they're in right now, uh, their primary driving motivation is food. And especially as the summer goes on, um, they're driven even more because they're building up the reserves for the winter. But as people are living closer to bears and the population expands, really important that people take care of four or five things, simple things to do. Uh, no bird feeders from March to November. That's normally when uh, they're out and about. Uh, compost piles, be careful with, especially with sweets and meats. You can put a little bit of lime on that to sort of cut the smell. Uh, garbage, if you have garbage pickup, it should not be out any more than the day that it's being picked up. If there are things in there that might attract a bear, like meat or any sort of sweet or something smells good, uh, a couple capfuls of ammonia. Oh, I have we'll to help, that. We'll help uh, cut that smell down. Uh, if you have pets or livestock, uh, their food should not be out. Um, and last but not least, if you're into grilling, uh, the grill should be kept clean or burned off or, if possible, stored if you know that there are bears uh, in proximity. So what will the, will the bears come and what, will they, what, what do they like about the grills? What uh, just the smell of the meat and the drippings uh, they like. Uh, there are 80, 80 to 85% um, um, uh, vegetarian, but they also have a carnivore side, so they do like meat. Um, the issue with food really is if a bear gets used to being fed uh, around people and becomes associated uh, with people, especially in terms of food, uh, those are bears that can turn into problem bears. So last year, I'm, I'm not sure if you saw the video of the woman up at uh, Sessions Woods. Uh, I did, yeah. Um, that was a young bear that uh, unfortunately had become what we call habituated to people. It had a couple of uh, encounters in West Hartford, both driven by food. And uh, when a bear gets habituated, it's not common, but they can start to show predatory uh, behavior. Black bears are normally very afraid of people. Uh, that's why if you're in the woods, uh, if you're making noise or they smell you, you're never really going to see them uh, because they vacate uh, the area. But if they do become habituated, that's when they can become a problem. And they're a very large, obviously powerful, strong animal. Uh, and we need to do everything we can to minimize that. Because once a bear gets to that point, which is what happened last year in Sessions Woods, uh, it definitely showed predatory behavior. A black bear should never follow you. Uh, if a black bear follows you, that's a, a natural sign that they're looking at you as prey. And uh, that's exactly what happened with the young woman on the trail at Sessions Woods. Uh, and that bear went so far as to actually nuzzle, put his mouth on her leg. Uh, so unfortunately, when that happens, there's no choice but to euthanize the bear. So people were, uh, bear lovers were extremely upset exactly. about that situation. And I think people at DEP and the volunteers were as well. Uh, I know all of the uh, wildlife biologists that are associated with fur bears, then bears fall into that category. And most, like me, are passionate about all wildlife, but especially bears. And the last thing they want to see is a bear that has to be put down because people have been careless with food. And those four or five things, the bird feeders, compost piles, uh, garbage, uh, pet and livestock food, if we do a good job with those, chances are uh, will go way down that there'll be a higher conflicts with higher number of conflicts with bears even as the population grows now the fact that the population is growing makes that all the more urgent and if you think about it it's not a uh, big ask of us in terms of changing our habits 
to accommodate as I what I think is again a magnificent animal that we're lucky to have in our uh, ecosystem. Yeah, no, I agree totally. So let let's just review that one more time. No bird food out after March. End of March to the end, end of, of March. November. Okay, end of March. So we could still in, feed in a March. normal year. Yeah. Uh, in a normal year. Okay. Uh, compost. If you have compost, if it's enclosed, to tightly enclosed, that's what you would recommend, or. Nothing sweet in there? Nothing. S bears love sweets and meats. Okay, they, so mostly, I, I mean, I've never composted meat to begin yeah, with. Some but. people do, though, unfortunately. Oh, really? So if you do have sweets, like let's say you have uh, watermelon rinds, yeah. as an example, or you do have meat in there, you can sprinkle it with lime, and that'll help dissipate uh, okay. the smell so that okay. they can't smell it. The reason this is such a critical issue is bears, uh, their two strongest senses are smell and uh, uh, hearing. Their sense of smell is six to seven times better than a bloodhound. Wow. So a, a bear that's in its normal habitat can smell the foods that we may carelessly leave out, you know, several miles away, and it will draw them. And uh, fortunately, they're very smart. If you remove that food source, usually even if they come back a time or two after that, they'll stop coming back unless they're habituated and they've been, you know, you've got neighbors that aren't following the rules. Mm -hmm that keeps drawing them back into the neighborhood. But the good news is if you do remove that source, even after one or two times, they learn and they'll stop. And uh, the chances of there eventually being a problem with that bear in terms of conflicts go way down. So I'm really glad um, uh, you've shared that. That was something I really didn't understand. Um, so another question that I, people keep asking is, where do they go in the winter? Uh, they go into dens, and uh, just like with feeding, they're very opportunistic. Uh, you'll find them anywhere from uh, mountain laurel groves to uh, hollowed out trees uh, to uh, sometimes they're right out in the open. I was involved with some denning research this spring with DEP, and uh, they're tracking about 34 sows uh, statewide. And every year they check on the sows and the uh, progress of their cubs. This particular den was right out, right out in the open in the middle of a wetland up in Bark Hampstead. Um, anywhere basically where they can feel secure is where they'll den. Um, like us, they decorate, you know, if it's in a cave or something, they'll drag uh, soft material in, whether it's moss or leaves or whatever. Uh, this particular one, I was amazed, it was probably two to three feet high, maybe four to five feet long, oblong in shape, had a nice little indentation for where the sow could lie and she had four cubs that were with her. Wow. It was a really remarkable experience. So it, in Simsbury for instance we have 30 percent of our town is open space so it, is it most likely that they have that they all find a space in that in that area? Yeah, and the, their their habitat again is forest mostly. And we have uh, a lot of and forest. And you have a lot of forest. Connecticut um, back in 1650 when the first folks from uh, Europe started coming here, uh, there were a lot more bears than we had today. Connecticut was almost 100% forested, and they were all old, gro old growth forests. Uh, the nadir of us taking bears and taking their habitat occurred in about 1850. Uh, they were pretty much indiscriminately slaughtered from 1650 to then. Um, slaughtered for food or for pelt? Uh, Both? More for being po a nuisance. Oh they were considered a nuisance and or a threat to more desirable uh, game species or uh, domesticated animals. Uh, from 1850 on, uh, things changed with the economy. It went from an agrarian society where all the clearing of land stopped, and that's when our forests had a chance to recover. And we're now back to 66% forested throughout the state, most of it mature. Uh, which is one reason why, you know, you asked earlier to open the interview uh, why there are so many more bears. Cause it's very simple because they have great habitat. And again, the fact that they don't have, <clears throat> excuse me, a large predators that prey on them, the biggest thing that's killing them right now is car accidents. There were about 35 that were killed last year on our highways. Um, and that's largely because of the fact that they're dispersing, looking for new territories. And a large portion of the meat that they eat is through scavenging carry-on. So they're drawn to road kills. Uh -huh. So that, that's so what brings them on the highway. Things, yes. And obviously they're tough to see at night because of their color, just right. like a moose. So, right. so uh, how big is the, in, uh, the area that an average bear travels? Uh, for instance, that one bear who came to my house and finished up my bird food. 
and then came back again. I sort of, I have the feeling that he makes the rounds. And how, uh, is that true? Uh, in Connecticut, the uh, average male range can be anywhere from 10 to 50 square miles. Depends on the quality of the uh, habitat. Females are usually more 5 to 12. Uh, bears will travel uh, great distances, though, for other purposes, whether ranges or whatever. Um, there, was a, there was a young adult uh, a couple years ago that was uh, ended up in Middletown. It was maybe about 18, 19th month old bear, weighed about 150 pounds. Uh, it was relocated from Middletown into Mishamasic State Forest, which is a beautiful forest that runs from Portland over to uh, into Glastonbury. Uh, unfortunately, that bear turned up dead uh, some period afterwards. It had wandered all the way up into Vermont and was shot. And because they're tagged and there's cooperation between the state agencies, we were able to tell that it was the same bear. So normally they're in a well-defined range. Um, there's one male and several females in a range, but uh, particularly younger bears will move uh, great distances. So that bear is probably the one that comes to your house, I'm sure, is in his range and he's making the rounds. <laughs> right. So, Again, the, the one thing that the thing that really drives them is food. That's right. really all they're thinking about right. after mating. Uh, and especially into the late summer and into the fall, they go into a phase called hyperphagia where they're actually feeding 20 hours a day oh. to build up their reserves for their winter sleep. So um, you mentioned a, sh a bear shooting in Vermont. Is it legal to shoot bears in Vermont? I think they do have a hunting season. Okay. Most of the states around us have hunting seasons. But we don't. We do not. Right now, uh, the management of bears in Connecticut by, uh, by a DUP, and again, the goal of that is balance between our needs and the needs of, of the, the species, has evolved over time. Uh, when bears first showed up, there was not much that was done in terms of management. There were just a few that were up in the northwest corner. As the populations have grown, obviously the management structure and the means that we use to uh, maintain that balance have changed. So uh, essentially, if you call, we ask people to call DEP, if you call and a bear is in your backyard and it's not creating problems or conflicting with people in some way, DEP will just say, enjoy it, make some noise, you know, we're not going to do anything, and so forth. If the bear uh, follows or is creating some sort of potential danger, obviously they would relocate. Uh, relocation is limited to areas in our state. We can't relocate across state lines. People ask, it's against the law. People ask, well, why couldn't we take the bear at Sessions Woods and just move it into some remote area? Well, one, it's against the law, and then two, once they become predatory, it's it, right. it obviously can't uh, do that. So, so uh, another question is: How many bears do you, uh, do you t uh, have ear tags, and do they does deep tag the new young bears, the cubs? Um, great question. Um, there are thirty four sows that are tagged uh, as part of this study that's going on. Uh, you probably heard uh, the name Paul Rigo. He's yes. the grandfather yes. of, uh, and he's the one I initially invited yeah. through Dennis Shane. And he just said that he has no time. Yeah. Right. Well, that's why there are people like me around right. or why they're well. looking for volunteers and master wildlife folks. So, um, he started a study back in, I believe 2002 where, uh, the 34 sows are, it's grown. And there are now 34 sows that every winter there's a trip made into the den. Those are tagged. Uh, they're also collared with a radio collar and a GPS. The cubs are not tagged because at that point in time, the cubs are only a little less than two months old. They weigh about five pounds. Uh, they do get the GPS chips that our uh, pets get. And in fact, I asked Paul, how much are those GPS chips? Because I was curious because what the vets charge. And he says, oh, they're about six bucks. Oh. And it takes like less than a second to put them in. You just, they go right in, you lift the skin that goes right between the shoulder blades. So they use those to track uh, mortality. Uh, bears are also tagged if they have a uh, interaction with people that requires recording that interaction. So the tags are used not only for research, but also for uh, bears that have had uh, human encounters. There are no, uh, there's no significance to the color. Some people say does red mean danger, like the old Homeland Security. Right. The answer is no. Uh, all get two tags. Sometimes people ask why do they have one tag? It's just because one of them fell out. That's oh, why they, they put, both get, they get they, two. They, they get oh. two. Um, and the tags, again, are used for identification, not only for research, but 
in the case of the Barrett Sessions Woods, uh, because there's a database kept of all the activity of the bears, especially any potential problems, uh, we knew very quickly that that was the bear that had had issues in West Hartford. Okay, so there's another reason why it's really important to uh, report bear sightings. Yes, uh, right. So and if, if the overwhelming majority are, are not tagged. So um, the bear, the bear that I had this summer had a, a red tag, and the one last summer had a white tag. Uh, so uh, somebody else asked me to ask. Um, they notice bears near them. Um, in the wetlands, and they hear branches breaking, and they see the leaves shaking, and they think that they're eating skunk cabbage. They're right. They're right. Especially in the spring. Uh, as I indicated earlier, bear, uh, black bears are uh, 80 to 85 percent vegetarian. Part of the reason that riparian or uh, wetlands are important is in the spring when they wake up, uh, there's a lot of tender vegetation that uh, they can easily digest and start to regenerate their energy that they've expended. Uh, um, over their winter sleep. Uh, as the summer goes on, they'll eat all kinds of native plants, everything from viburnum to red, na red maples. Uh, as the berries ripen, that's a real bonanza, they'll eat all kinds of uh, native berries, service berries and others. Uh, and into the fall, they're heavily dependent on acorns, believe it or not. Oh, really? Uh, along with white-tailed deer, turkey, and squirrels. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, this year there's been a large squirrel population. And chipmunks. And chipmunks. And you probably haven't seen as many deer in your yard. And, and the reason is they depend on acorns, and there were so many last year yeah. that the squirrels' population could increase. The deer don't have to come out of the woods as much because they got food in the oh, woods. Interesting. Um, but bears uh, are also very dependent on acorns. A lot of good uh, nutrition for them moving into the fall and the winter. That's fascinating. I mean, the chipmunks, they're just... They exploded, and I did notice we had a lot of acorns, so that's yeah. why. And and it, I thought it also had something to do with the milder winter. No, I think it's more food related. Yeah. More food related. Uh, the milder winter uh, bears do sleep, but in a winter like last year, uh, unless the it's a sow with cubs, uh, they probably went into the dens a little later. That's why that bird feeder guideline is for an average year, because typically they're driven into the dens by a combination of temperature and then depth of snow, because snow obviously would cover forage that they're eating in, uh, in the forest, things like acorns. Oh, so until it snows, they're yeah. probably still foraging they can be active, and not. Yes. Now, the, the people talk about hibernation and bears sleep. Are they sleeping? Uh, black bears are in a, uh, a, a deep winter sleep. They're not uh, in true hibernation. So when I'm uh, presenting, I always ask how many people are hikers in the audience and how many hike in the winter, because just because it's winter time, you still have to be bear aware. Uh, they do slow down all of their anatomy, their autonomous nervous system functionality, their br uh, breathing and heart rate and so forth. Uh, they don't defecate, they don't urinate, uh, they reabsorb all that uh, for hydration and believe it or not, nutrition. Uh, the sows actually stay in that sleep even while the cubs are, nur are, are uh, nursing on them. But if it does get warm or they hear something or sense something in terms of danger or noise outside of their den, they can and will wake up and very quickly become active. So uh, I, I know we're sort of reaching the end already, but um, you talked about things that people could do around their house in terms of food. What should people do who are out? walking we have so many walking trails around here how should they or gardening in sort of places how should they behave typically um, bears as I indicated black bears uh, have a healthy native uh, fear of people and that's the general rule and they're, they're not aggressive they're not near they're nothing like uh, their cousins out west the browns and the and the grizzlies so if you're in the woods hiking and uh, you're making some noise which you should do if you're in you know you're in bear country um, or if the bear smells you ahead of time, uh, you usually would not see the bear. There wouldn't even be an encounter. Uh, exceptions could be if you were on a path that was very curvy and up and down like this, and you weren't making noise, and let's say the wind was blowing to you, not to the bear, so the bear couldn't hear you or, or smell you. Uh, in that case, you might happen upon a bear or surprise a bear. It's not very common, but it could happen. So when you say make noise, uh, do you suggest people wear bells? Well, or, or? bells are, I think, you know, we, we think probably human voice is better because but they... But if you're alone, if you might be alone, you wouldn't be talking to yourself. Well, just once in a while, hey, hey, bear, bear, whatever, clap your hands, <laughs> oh, okay. so forth. Um, 
if you did happen to see a bear like that, um, normally it's a, quite an exhilarating experience, obviously, if you're like 10 feet away from a 450 pound right. animal, uh, wild animal. But normally you would just uh, make yourself larger. So you would do something like this. Uh, back away slowly, so you want to give the bear birth. Uh, don't stare directly into the bear's eyes. That can be construed as uh, being uh, aggressive behavior, uh -huh. but keep your eyes on them. Just back away slowly and give it birth, and usually the bear will just continue along its, its way, and there wouldn't be an issue. They may be, you know, if they're a little more uh, irritated, you know, they might do what we call bluff charge, where they could take a few quick hops towards you and then stop. But the same thing, uh, just back away slowly. Never run from a bear, a black bear, because uh, they can run 35 miles an hour. You're not going to outrun them. Wow. Um, and running can elicit a predatory response uh -huh. and even an otherwise non-aggressive bear because if you think about nature itself, the things that run from them typically are things that they might want to eat. Fascinating. Yeah. Paul, our time is up. This has been absolutely fascinating. I'm so delighted that you came. Uh, our, I want to thank everybody here at SCTV behind the scenes for helping us get the show on the air, director Karen Hanville and editor Kristen Benedict. Thanks especially to my guest Paul Colburn. It's been uh, such a pleasure and I learned so much and I'm sure our viewers will too. And finally, thank you for joining us. If you missed any portion of the show, you can always find it on our website at simsburytv.org. I'm Dominique Avery. See you next time on The Simsbury View. Since 1984, SCTV has been the place to turn in Simsbury to watch local government in action. But we are more than local government and school meetings. SCTV is the only place where you can check out all the candidates in local elections. We have high school sports and exercise classes. Other shows keep you up on health, finance, poetry, music, and Simsbury hot topics. Now we need your help. Simsbury Community TV is embarking on a major capital fundraising campaign to bring SCTV into the 21st century. We've received a generous grant from the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, but now we must match it. We want everyone to watch us on TV or on our website, but even if you never do, please help so that we can continue to keep your government open and you informed. Someday, when there's a crisis, you will want SCTV to be there. Hi, my name is Steve Mitchell, Vice President of Mitchell Auto Group. I hope you'll join me in supporting SCTV since 1984, your connection to your town, your schools, and your government.